friends right now. I know, that was weird timing. <sighs> well, I guess that's it for the tunes. <laughs> okay. Hey, video recording, what's up? <laughs> this is our fir the first like morning podcast I've ever done. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you typically do it? What's that? Is there a specific time that you kind of aim for? It just always kind of seems to be at night just because like that's when people are available. Yeah, um, that's Talk to Apple Care. See if I have space on my phone for a big voice memo. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask you that. Oh, we have plenty. Oh, you do? Good. Teach me how to do that, cause yeah, I know I have. I have like two gigabytes left. <laughs> no, it's like this weird thing with Apple that it, like, as you use your phone, it like caches. What is that oh, word? Yeah. I never French pronounce it. I always, yeah, yeah. I always. Yeah, you only read it. it. You never say it out yeah, loud. Like a catch, a cache. Oh. <laughs> okay. I don't know. So I'm just. I feel like I should just put this like this, right? Yeah. Yeah. You want to do a few test runs? Testing, testing. Hi. Well, let's like talk as if we were just like oh. talking to <laughs> to each other and see like if it's picking it up from here. I feel okay. like it should be good. Yeah, I think okay. that's probably fine. Testing, testing. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hello, beautiful people. Welcome back to This Human Thing. This is episode five. And today I have Eliza O'Donovan on the podcast. And Eliza went to my college and we were roommates our senior year. And now she's out here visiting me in Cali. Um, also, we had a little bit of a technical issue this morning, which is <clears throat> my laptop won't turn on so we're recording on my phone so hopefully <laughs> hopefully that sounds okay um but yeah the podcast is just about sharing stories connecting with other people because everyone has their own path and by listening to other people's paths maybe we can connect to certain areas of their journey and use it to apply to our own uh and eliza is someone who is all about connection and spreading love and making people feel seen and heard and included and she's got the most bubbly loving personality and she's just a little ray of sunshine just spreading that to everyone that she meets so I'm really excited to have her on today so that we can talk about her story and her journey and just talk about other things too just having a good conversation uh, so welcome, Eliza. Thanks Aww. for thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> That's so such a sweet intro. <laughs> Kat's so eloquent with her words. It always um, she always just knows how to make my heart burst <laughs> well, in a good way. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's really exciting to kind of be on the behind scenes after listening to some of your episodes. Um, yeah, and thank you, you know, so much again for having me. This trip to San Diego has just been everything that I've needed recently. So it's just been a really great cleanser and a nice, you know, reminder of, you know, what it's like to, I don't know, have kind of a step back of, you know, all the crazy day to day type things that might be going on. Um, but it's really, it's really been a treat. Ugh, yeah, Eliza's going to the airport in maybe like two hours so actually less so we're oh, squeezing geez. this podcast in before <laughs> before we ship her away um no it's been it's been so good having you and yeah what do you think you. what do you think of the area and how is your I know you were just talking about the trip but yeah yeah no I'm happy to go more into that um well I've I've been to California before but I haven't been to San Diego 
Um, San Diego is just like a cute little dream. I just feel, I don't know, especially that first night when, um, you know, they were playing music on the beach. Um, EDM, we may find out later about me that I'm a huge EDM person. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, just having people that are just, I don't know, I, they seem just more liberated in their lives. They mm-hmm. seem like that they've just kind of found um, ways to wake up and... I mean, you know, it's harder to say since it's not, you know, it's a generalization, but just from the sense that I got, um, the people that are in your circle of life are just very free and have a lot of substance to them, have crazy stories, you know, they've already lived so much, you know, some almost lifetimes for some people, um, and just, you know, are very open and loving and are not, you know, wanting to kind of just dismiss people they're really wanting people to come in you know I love that about um for example going to festivals when you're able to just kind of jump into a new group and they're like hey yeah let's you know let's do this let's you want to come with us and hang out for the day you know they're just wanting to they don't care who you are they just want to like hang out and be with people and I just think that's really cool um and I just kind of got a lot of a sense of that. And even though, you know, obviously not everyone in San Diego is like that. No one is like that completely. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, you know, every day can vary to vary of if, how open you are. But um, I don't know. I just feel like that was a really good sense of what I got from everyone. And uh, at least everyone seemed very friendly, you know, if that's the, the bare minimum we can get. Um, Everyone just wanted everyone else to be happy, it seemed, and, you know, very friendly, open, as I've said a few times. But even just people at some shops, you know, I had, you know, a 15-minute conversation with a store, you know, a woman working in the store. (laughs) It was just, you know, even though that conversation wasn't, you know, heavily, um, wasn't deep substance, it was still, you know, so lovely to just chat with someone who just wants to talk. I just think that's so cute. Um... Also, the humidity is a great, you know, not having any humidity here is great. Um, I've grown up on the East Coast, haven't really been able to make it out to the West too much. Um, But that is crazy, just stepping off of the plane and the weather is just so perfect here. I just feel like it would be such a nice way to kind of keep your serotonin going. (laughs) No, for sure. Like, I think just sunshine in general, that's one of those things where you can be in not a great mood and if you just step out into the sun and just feel that for a few minutes Mm -hmm. that is such a changer yeah it changes so much um and like being outside is and these are like such simple things but being outside is just so important for your mental health and for your physical health and if you're living in like a swamp which is like what virginia was like an actual swamp where it's just like so hot and so humid in the summer a lot of the times like you don't want to be outside and like when you're cooped up inside all day like that can really take a toll on yeah oh yeah your state (laughs) no it really does i mean and that's why you know some people argue that seasonal depression is not a thing but I mean in my opinion I totally think it is a thing um and that's why you know when it's cold out and you don't want to go outside and you're kind of more stagnant you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing as a person you're supposed to be moving and you know um contributing in some way you're supposed to be you know at least you know just kind of moving around no, and for sure. you don't want to be horizontal all the time but it's you know really hard for some people to not be and when you don't have that sun exposure you know it's like you're turned on a like airplane mode a little bit yeah, definitely <laughs> speaking of airplanes i'm going to close the window because um i live near an airport and sometimes the planes fly over and it's just like pretty loud um it's been cool to listen to though I don't mind the noise. Yeah. Kind of it. It's been really cool. There were uh, there was a really intense one last night. It was like I just jumped out of jet. Like, <laughs> yeah, it almost sounded like something. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's interesting because I think historically we all lived near the equator, mm-hmm. um, and then we just started to spread out as you know, population grew and things like that, but definitely, like, I know in the winter, I just feel like I have no energy, and I just want to crawl up in a ball, and I'm, I'm just a very cold person, so I'm just cold all the time, and I just remember 
you know, back living in Virginia and going to school at JMU and just shuffling around all the time, just freezing, continuously clenched up. And like that tension on your body is not good. And (laughs) yeah, the only thing that helped me embrace the cold was definitely snowboarding. Oh yeah. And then also like when you're cold, just letting your muscles relax because it actually makes you less cold. Yeah. But you think that you need to like tense up and yeah. I know that was something that, um, I think, uh, yeah, that I was uh, told to start practicing to, like, just relax when you're in the cold. And it really does make such a huge difference. Because mm-hmm. um, you don't realize how much, you know, I mean, it's kind of just when you're realizing that you're, like, putting all attention somewhere when it's your whole body. Yeah. And you're able to just relax. It makes it much more bearable. Because when you're, like, tensing your muscles, your mind actually starts becoming tense and mm. feeling constricted. Right. And it puts you in a bad mood. <laughs> and so by letting your body be soft, whether you're in the cold or just in your day-to-day, whatever you're doing, we are always holding so much tension in our bodies. Yeah. Um, by learning to just continuously catch yourself and just relax. Mm-hmm. It just holistically makes you more relaxed and then your brain is able to function better because it doesn't feel like it's in like tense, constricted er, mode all the time. Um, Yeah, especially when you're just like outside complaining about it. You're mm -hmm. like, I'm so cold. Like, you know, just, you know, cursing at yourself saying, why am I so cold? Like, I just want to be inside. Like, that's just going to obviously put you in a place where you're miserable (laughs) yeah because you just keep feeding into the story and you're like poor Mm -hmm. me blah 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 and like you know we'll do that with the temperature but we do that with everything Everything. (laughs) yeah everything Mm -hmm. I mean you know you've said this on your podcast um but it's just it's such a a good way to wake up in a sense when you're just realizing that you're just making up all of these issues in mm-hmm. a sense that you know you just are trying to make problem after problem because the thought of right now being enough is unimaginable you just it's apparently impossible for people <laughs> yeah you know definitely and you know that's not to say that you should just you know melt into a little blob and do nothing the yeah, rest of your yeah. life like your problems are there to point you to hey like it, you could make things better Mm -hmm. by doing these things but like don't get caught up in it don't put so much pressure on yourself because that's just gonna make you miserable um and I lost my train of thought (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah but like going back to what you were saying earlier about people being super open here Mm -hmm. um I've definitely noticed that too and I think that's a big stereotype of east coast versus west coast of course it doesn't apply to everyone but it's just a general theme and I think like a big part of it is just the pressure that is on people um generally in the east coast Mm. um because like I grew up in northern Virginia right outside DC you grew up right outside Baltimore um and I don't know I feel like those (laughs) suburbs near bigger cities there's so much academic pressure and so much pressure to um do really well and excel and then make a lot of money in your job for whatever reason yeah to be successful Um, and over here, there's definitely still that pressure that definitely still exists, but I feel like the creative side to like follow (laughs) as cheesy as it sounds like going out and following your dreams, even if that doesn't mean that you're getting a paycheck at all or a very small one, I feel like that's a lot more encouraged out here. Yeah, it seems that way. I know it's also, um it seems like people are just comfortable with that in a Mm -hmm. sense like um they don't as you said like they don't feel as um I guess pushed to have like a paycheck to paycheck or sorry to have you know a more stable paycheck like people are able to kind of just find happiness out of their own day-to-day experience Mm -hmm. and you know finding ways to make sure that they can survive on you know on the side yeah because it really doesn't take that much to survive like even if you're homeless you're still alive and I always I always think about that I'm like you know Kat like you're fortunate enough to be in a position that even if everything around you falls apart and you are quote-unquote a complete failure like the worst thing that's going to happen is you're homeless Mm -hmm. and like I don't know some homeless people out here are like killing it there's this one guy who 
lives in Ocean Beach where I live and he has he pushes around his pit bull in a stroller and he has oh this big purple polka dot fluffy top hat and he's just like <laughs> living it up he just not yeah that's so cute anyway so I love that there's always that yeah you uh, could just you know have a <laughs> it's quite quite the picture he's a homie Oh, that's so nice. Mm-hmm. I know, you know, the same thing, too, with, like, the weather, is that, um, you know, being homeless in San Diego is very different than being homeless in New York. Yeah, that's for sure. with a lot of, obviously, different variables, but I feel like, at least just having that sun um, and, like, warm, comfortable weather, that makes, that would make that experience so different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's mm-hmm. also sad because I, w- I was telling you this earlier in the week how um, Ocean Beach has uh, one of the larger homeless populations in San Diego because they just get like pushed out of everywhere else because it's like I don't want to see this in my neighborhood like I don't you know mm-hmm. um, but just people in Ocean Beach are just so nice they're just like why like we're not gonna like where are you gonna go we're not gonna kick you out if I were homeless I'd want to be chilling at the beach too yeah. like <laughs> I love that and it, I mean that speaks so well of everyone in that situation mm-hmm. you know where I mean I think that's what humanity is supposed to come down to where you know we're just helping people and we're like you know don't just push people out like be empathetic mm-hmm. and you know, I mean, even if it's not, like, necessarily um, fully supporting where, you know, those people are trying to make sure that they're not homeless, but even just doing stuff like that, just making it kind of an open space for everybody, I Mm -hmm. think that's really important. And so what if it smells like pee? (laughs) No, like, when when you're walking down the sidewalk, like, if you get a little too close to a bush, you just get a huge whiff of urine. But, you know, it comes, you smell it, you're disgusted, a moment later it's gone. You just and you're about okay. It. You're okay. It's just pee. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wrote down a f- oh, most of my points were on my computer, but I have a couple in my notes so I can bring up a few topics. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I'm game to talk about anything. Heck yeah. So why don't we dive into your personal story a little okay. bit and we don't have to go like super super into the details but mm-hmm. just whatever you feel that you want to speak on because um a big part of this podcast as I mentioned in the intro is to listen to other people's stories mm-hmm. and what has your path been to find like peace and joy and love in your life oh so it's so hard. Yeah. Because, it, you know, obviously everything ties into each other. Yeah, your whole life has been a journey <laughs> yeah. to here, and it's going to continue from this point on. Yeah. Um, well, I guess... I guess it, a lot of it starts in middle school. I'll try to kind of not, you know, do a nice balance of not putting in too much, but <laughs> give me enough. Yeah. Um, I always have kind of struggled with, um, depression. Um, and definitely, I mean, and that's why I'm also like, obviously seasonal depression is a real thing because, you know, it would get to the point where I was terrified of the winters coming. Cause I was like, I don't know what the hell my mindset is going to warp into. Um, it would always just, you know, it kind of progressively got worse and worse as I got older. Um, but in middle school, um, I never had like a bad like school experience. It was just definitely all in my head where, Uh, You know, I had a great group of girlfriends. Um, They were really sweet, which I feel like not a lot of people in middle school can relate to. Um, I just, because, you know, middle school is pretty brutal. (laughs) Yeah. Everyone's trying to figure out themselves. But I felt like, you know, kind of the stereotypical, I'm not like everyone else. Like, I'm so different. Like, no one likes the music I like. (laughs) Um, No one likes Drake. Like, I like Drake. (laughs) (laughs) Um true (laughs) um it was like I don't know like I was never really preppy in a sense even though like the area I grew up in was like super preppy so I just kind of you know being a kid like kind of just followed it but it never like really felt right like I never really wanted to be like a cheerleader type girl um excuse me um but so I like suffered pretty hard from depression and just being like really in my head and um uh, and like eating disorder, uh, 
yeah, I guess kind of eating dysmorphia, but, you know, body image issues and, like, eating disorders, um, and I just was kind of a mess, um, and no one knew it, no one had any idea, I just hid it, and as my mom says, I really like to put on a mask to kind of hide my own problems, um, and not really talk about it, and then in middle, or, sorry, in high school, I went to, um, a whole new high school, Freshman year, I still felt like I didn't really fit in. I felt like I really wanted to um, experience life. And I was just so sick of like waiting around for like, you know, quote unquote, what you think that means, you know, going out and doing stuff, but you're experiencing life every day. Um, But I just really wanted to grow up really fast. And I just was, I just felt really lonely, even though I had friends, but I didn't feel like uh, I really had anyone to actually fully relate to. Um, until I found, like, a few girls who were, like, kind of the rebellious, you know, like, I don't give an F kind of people. And, uh, you can curse if you want. Okay. <laughs> sure. Just wanted to protect the, the ears of the sensitive. It's okay. It's an explicit show. <laughs> That's true. Um, but um, basically, um, I ended up... Um, trying to just not talk about you know specifics of people too hard but Mm -hmm. um uh basically just ended up having a friend who was really really you know depressed and suicidal and it just got to me so hard where um you know it fed into my depression so I became really bad um but then also seeing like her extreme like hers was like way worse you know like suicidal and you know very like graphic stuff and I was almost like well maybe like mine's not, like my illness isn't even like good enough because it's like I'm not like to that extreme like I'm such like like a pussy honestly mm-hmm. like I'm not like like that sick in a sense um and it was just like really unhealthy um you know comparing and like my whole world was absorbed by like making sure she's like you know gonna be alive the next day um and it was really scary and no one had any clue about that either um, and I basically, uh, hanging out with like older kids in the high school, I just kind of grew up way too fast. Um, and it made me realize that it's like, you know, you can't put your happiness on other people, like no matter what, um, because you know, not everyone's perfect or no one's perfect. Um, and you just have to find kind of that distance between, you know, empathy and fully loving people, but also making sure that you're taking care of yourself and your mental health. Um, And, you know, she was older, so she graduated, and I was kind of able to relax a little bit. Um, She's doing great now, I think, in life. Um, We don't really stay in touch just because I think, you know, um, past move on, but um, she seems doing well from from what I've been able to see, which just makes me really happy. Um, But then... um, I don't know. I also grew up in a a Christian household, too, so that kind of always had me spiritually open, in a sense, um, with a lot of weird stuff going on, like my house being haunted and having to have an exorcism. Yeah, let's go into that later. (laughs) I put that in the Oh, you did? Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's a fun story. Um, (laughs) But, like, kind of stuff like that, you know, where um, uh, stuff was kind of pushed in my life to show me that it's not what you think it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another example that I really like is um, my uncle who lives in Maine, whenever we would go up, he loved, you know, kind of encouraging me to go be by myself and like go like take walks and stuff. My whole family would encourage that, but something about my uncle just really stood out to me about that. Um, and so, you know, I just remember like walking down the path in Maine by myself when I was probably like eight. Um, I'm skipping all over the timeline right now. <laughs> Dude, you're totally fine. It it's it all comes together. <laughs> it does. Um, and I guess that's how time can kind of work in itself too. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but um, I just remember being like kind of having a weird out of body moment when I was really little, and just being like thinking about the voice in my head and like what what was it that was like controlling or making me want to you know move my hands. What was it that was, like, making me, like, want to walk down this path to begin with? Like, kind of just thinking about that. Um, so I would have nice um, kind of existential thoughts up in Maine when I got to go up. Um, but then, anyways, fast forward to, um, I guess, senior, or no, I guess college. Um, kind of throughout college, a lot of 
traumatic stuff came back to haunt me, um, stuff that I had blocked out. I completely, uh, I guess, you know, something triggered for my memory to open back up to remember stuff that happened when I was little, um, people kind of taking advantage of me and, um, you know, just non-consensual stuff. Um, and so then that kind of was like stuff I was working through and like also kind of blocking out, um, not, you know, refusing to really, um, deep into or dive into it so that I could, you know, figure it out. Um, and then also junior year, my uncle, the same one I was just referring to committed suicide. And that was, I mean, you were there for all of that. And that was just like the most, like one of the most mind blowing things to me. And that was just, cause I mean, just like the whole story behind it, just like really devastated me and resonated with me hard, especially with, you know, he's living up in Maine in the seasonal depression where, um, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's just really, really hard to deal with. He was my favorite relative, um, pretty much. I mean, you know, love all you guys <laughs> so much, but I, Courtney was my uncle with the name of my uncle. He was just like my best friend in a sense, even though I didn't get to see him like too often, I got to see him every year for, you know, a nice chunk of time. And he was just so all about love and just, you know, taking people out to have an amazing time, give them the real experience of Maine. Cause he was just so passionate about, you know, where he lived, just being outside constantly. It just was a pure giver. Um, and just like the best dad, like he loved his kids so much, which also, you know, makes adds on to the pain of that because, you know, my, my family, ugh, my aunt and my cousins are so strong in watching them grow through all of this and, you know, be as stable as they are through all this. Oh my gosh, I can't even fathom it. But, um, that was really hard for me and it's still pretty hard for me, um, but then I guess too with like um, going to like how I got to where I am, um, I I guess too kind of, you know, with our friend group um, and that, you know, throughout college kind of opening up about mindfulness um, and just, you know, um, just working on yourself and self-growth. It's always been a goal of mine, but having that kind of um, strong friend group that's like all spiritual I've never had that before. I felt like I was the only one who um, really throughout my life, everyone, you know, everyone else wasn't really into it. Um, mm -hmm. And I couldn't really get people into it. Um, and having that friend group was so special to me because it was such a, I mean, you know, we're still such an amazing support system. And it really shows what having that similar foundation between people in your life, like what that does. Cause that's huge. It's so big. It's so big. <laughs> It's so, it's so wonderful and I feel so lucky to have you guys in my life. It really is amazing. Um, and so, you know, with all of that, that kind of also opened up kind of uh, a fluctuating, um, I get I, just a whole new world, honestly, about like, I, I was really anxious, you know, at first with trying to put it into practice and um trying to you know just improve my life and I think part of that was just because um it kind of put me in the middle between a few you know conflicting with conditional ways of being brought up and then also like these new ways and like th it's just kind of like a whole crash on reality and I think that kind of gave me a little bit of anxiety which I had never really experienced as much before it, you know was usually much more depression um and then you know working through that I felt like was so wonderful and being able to just kind of like tr like uh scan everything in like a healthy way was really great um but then like my previous traumas that I've faced have really just like been deeping in and out of my life like kind of just like hey like we're here you haven't dealt with me yet like yeah. hey like remember gonna... me yeah did you shove me down so long ago <laughs> here I am it was it was pretty awful. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um 
I didn't want to talk about it with anybody because I just was I, a few different things, especially since it was kind of like a whole bundle of stuff. Um, and I just really shut it out. And um, I guess kind of speeding up the story a little bit, basically, um, we just passed the, the anniversary of it. But um, I had been after I graduated college and I was staying with my parents, you know, post-college, trying to figure out what, what I want to do with my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I was just so unhappy. I was just not productive in a sense where I wasn't able to, like, go and be dependent or independent. Um, I wasn't able to make money for myself. I didn't have a car. I had to, like, work outside every day. And I really, like, don't... I hope this doesn't, like, come off as me bashing my parents. Like, I love my parents so much, and I'm very grateful for everything they've provided for me. But... Um, just being home was very, very bad for my mental health. And um, I just think it kind of put stresses on my parents um, where, you know, we had like kind of episodes that just like made it really bad. And um, I just kind of felt trapped. And I'm like, I'm never going to be able to get out and like do my life where I'm able to work. I'm not, you know, able to um, do anything because I wasn't able to leave the house. Um and that was really hard. And so um, I've always kind of had an addictive personality. And so when I would be like suffering my like really insane depressive episodes, you know, I'd kind of be indulging um, to like the max. <laughs> and like, you know, that's just um, because I wanted to feel numb. Like I just really didn't want to be conscious. I The idea of going to sleep and never waking up was really pleasant to me. Um, and... I basically almost, um, I think it was July 29th last year, um, I was home alone and I didn't, it's kind of a weird situation because like, it wasn't like I necessarily like intended it for it to go this way, but I think what the moral of it is just that I didn't care what happened, but I basically just drank like from like 4 p.m. to I think it was like 8 or 9 p.m. And like I... Turn off the TV, I had, like, gone upstairs, put myself to bed, and then next thing I know, well, I don't even remember going to bed, though, but, um, I, next thing I know, though, is that I wake up in the hospital, and they're like, um, like, you almost, you almost died last night, like, you had a BAC of, um, what was it, point three, what was it, it was, like, point three four nine. I think, it was, like, dang, like, I probably like if my dad my dad found me like I had fallen on my bed um heard a loud noise and came and checked on me and I like wasn't able to make sense and uh the doctor said like if he had come in any later to drop me off at the hospital I would have been dead and I'm like hmm like that's weird like I just didn't really know what to make sense of it um I basically had to tell my parents about like all the trauma that like was coming up they were saying, like, the only thing, like, you could really say was, like, that you just wanted to be numb, like, you didn't want to feel anything, and I'm, like, that's, like, I was just really, it was just an awful day, I didn't, the, but, like, the thing that stood out to me about that day the most, honestly, was that I didn't care that I almost died, I just felt so bad that my parents felt awful, that I put my parents through that, and that was also kind of a wake-up call, in a sense, for me, where it's, like, I'm really, like, I'm not like growing still in the way that I want to be and I need to like really work on my self-love like I need to get out of this house like in any way I can um and I started going to therapy and that helped the home situation was still weird because it was like even though I had told my parents like everything that I was going through they still like after that conversation it felt like none of it happened and I don't know if they just didn't know how to handle it because like how does a parent handle that I don't blame them that they don't know But it was just weird that it was, like, never really talked about again. And, like, me going to therapy was, like, being used against me. And, like, I felt so guilty. And um, I'm just, like, I need to get out of the house. So then Audrey and I moved to Richmond. And um, just... Audrey's the other girl who lived with us. Oh, yeah. Senior year. No, no, no. (laughs) Go on. Just filling in the folks. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And so Audrey and I just, like, we were driving one day in Baltimore. And we were, like... (laughs) fuck it 
we're, let's, let's move to Richmond in like three weeks. And we did it. We just did it. I got a job. Um, I got a car and I was able to finally have money to get a car, which was, I mean, being on my own, I feel like it's just now what it shows that that's really what I want in life. Like, I don't want to be dependent on other people. I think it like really hinders my ability to grow and learn for myself. Um, being able to now like meditate and read, you know, it's all actually now being applied to my life to be able to, you know, be happy with myself. Because, you know, a lot of the ways that I would kind of get through life was just um, making sure other people were happy. Because that was what was important to me is that if, you know, if I can't be happy, like I want other people to be happy. And like, you know, if I can like do that in some way, like I've lived a good life. But then obviously that goes to show that, you know, I almost (laughs) killed myself. So apparently that's not what I actually wanted. (laughs) Um, And yeah, I mean, now just kind of having that balance of um, growing and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like this past year has been really amazing. I feel like I was able to grow a lot during college, especially like with the support of, you know, all you guys. Um, I think that was just kind of a nice wake up call for me to like be like okay like you're focusing too much on other people you really need to get down and dirty with yourself and I feel like that time being with your parents when you were so isolated because you didn't have a car and Mm -hmm. all of that it forced you to be with yourself and it's like you aren't always going to have other people not only to like depend on but you're not always going to be able to give your love to other people and it was Mm -hmm. kind of like life saying hey like remember yourself like give some love to this thing it needs attention yeah yeah and the previous trauma that I was facing made it really hard to do that Mm -hmm. because it was like how like like such shame and like um I disgust and also you know the, the thought too with my uncle where it's like if he's in his mid 40s and he's still feeling depressed and like that can happen that made me feel really hopeless um and I wrote like a a nice paper just kind of talking about like my conflict of like what does that mean for me like if I'm struggling with depression too like what kind of life is that if you're just constantly battling that but of course you know to me now that perspective's changed and it's like um I don't know. I just think that's kind of a a negative way to look at it. And, you you know, there's multiple um, ways to look at things, obviously. But to me, it just seems kind of like a cop-out answer almost, where it's like, um, yes, depression is completely hindering and can be, you know, completely just, you can't even put into words how debilitating it can be for Mm -hmm. people. But for my case, at, at least I'm just talking about myself, like, I can definitely, like, fight through any, like, type of mental depression that I could be faced. And, like, kind of, I mean, what you said, too, I think that was, like, on the, one of the earlier days that I was here, Kat was saying, um, and you can expand on this, too, of course, just, like, no matter what, like, anxiety or, like, depressive episode you might be going through, like, your foundational mindset is that like you're in a sense content because it's like you're just like experiencing life and you're happy um and you know that you're able to kind of get through you know those those episodes yeah like for uh yeah (laughs) for me whenever I'm experiencing something amazing and beautiful or whether I'm experiencing something awful and horrible um in the past I would feel inside horrible or beautiful I was like always a reflection of what was going on outside of me and when I say outside of me that's not just my environment or my life circumstances but that could be the state of my mind or maybe my body is physically sick or I'm having toxic thoughts or I'm going through anxiety or depression or something like that or I have problems in a relationship no matter what those external things may be I've reach this like point of transformation where maybe it's something in my heart or something that's like my soul um that's always okay and that can never die like nothing can hurt that place inside Mm -hmm. of you not even death so no matter what's going on on the outside no matter what 
my mind state is, no matter what my life circumstances is. It's not necessarily that I'm always happy or I'm always um, at peace or joyful in terms of an emotion, like the emotion of happiness or the emotion of joy. It's, It's more subtle and it feels more something that's innate and is like always a part of you uh it's kind of hard to put into words the only thing I can say is there's like a little space inside of you that's always going to be okay and that always Mm -hmm. is okay and for me that space is like this quality of love yeah and love is going to shine through the darkness and it's going to be illuminated even further in the light and I think that reaching that point of yeah like as you said just being content no matter what's happening is really where you can draw so much power so Mm -hmm. you can stand so firm in yourself and in life and you can be a rock to other people um just through the example of no matter what happens I'm always okay and I'm going to choose to continue to love no matter what and my happiness is not conditional I'm no matter what happens whether life is shitty or life is extraordinary I'm, my life doesn't need to be extraordinary in order for me to be happy. My life can be horrible mm-hmm. and I can, can still choose to be happy because even though it feels so often that we don't have a choice, it really is a choice. Yeah. And that can sound, uh, I can't think of the word, but that can sound like untrue or like you're yeah. belittling someone to yeah. say, you can choose your happiness. And when you're in a state of deep depression, like, or like are you mocking me? you know? Yeah. Um, but that's why it takes, you know, meeting people where they are. And so you're not going to say that to someone who's deep, deep in depression, but you can say that to someone who has found a little bit of flow in their life and say like, see what you're feeling here. You can feel this all the time. Yeah. No, Uh, I complete. That's well said completely because that is, you know, something that I realized too, when I was facing, you know, my fluctuations of depression where, um, you know, you could just tell that it's like, you're the only one who can get yourself out of that mess. You're the only one it's, and it's all about changing your perspective and like just experiencing life so that you're able to, um, because you know, if you're not doing anything in a sense, like if you're just laying in bed all day, like, of course you're just going to stay unhappy. Like Mm -hmm. you're not, you're not pushing yourself to do something, but that's like the whole thing of depression where it's like, you can't get out of bed. Um, which is why it's so fucked up. Yeah. Um, but, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. (laughs) Audrey just walked in. (laughs) She did the devil. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I mean, I am totally with you where it's so important to know that, you know, just being able, I mean, and again, this, you can't say this to everybody, but being able to just wake up every day and know that you're experiencing this whether it's good or bad is actually so amazing yeah and it's just like that little reminder and I have to continuously remind myself of that because it's so easy for us to forget we were born forgetting Mm -hmm. essentially that we're always going to be okay and like have you ever noticed like if you're really 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 sad or really 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 angry or any kind of like super negative emotion you find yourself just in an awful Uh, situation Mm -hmm. it's almost like you're so wrapped up in the emotion and the feeling of bad and negativity have you ever like paused for a little like just a second and it's almost like there's like something inside like giving like a little wink or a little (laughs) smile and you kind of like laugh at your situation just for for a moment and then and then you just return back into the badness but it's so funny it's like I've noticed those states like if I'm really really sad or really really angry and I'm so engulfed in the emotion and it's almost part of me gets like a little bit exhausted for a second and then it's almost like I'm laughing at myself Mm -hmm. I'm like look at you so wrapped up in this and you're completely creating it all yourself yeah and that doesn't necessarily that realization or that pause or that breath doesn't necessarily make your situation any better but it just gives you that little break to a little pause so you can like see through the storm for a second and be like, oh, right, <laughs> this <laughs> is temporary. And there's something inside of me that's able to pause and almost like laugh at the situation. Yeah. Not that it's funny, but just that it's like a little bit of comedic relief. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it is. I mean, it's just funny to see how in your head that, you know, we can all get. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really is, you know, I guess, and I don't really know what allows us to do that, you know, because it's like, if, you know, the, the stream of consciousness um, versus like the <laughs> the voice in our head, I guess, I guess it's like almost the consciousness being like, stop listening to that voice like Mm. you know that's not you like you're just getting yourself all riled up for no reason Mm -hmm. I don't know like it's so funny because it is like a a form of checking in almost that you can't control but I totally totally have experienced that before (laughs) it's so funny like most people that I've I I mean I haven't brought this up to many people this isn't like a normal conversation (laughs) that I usually have about like a little wink (laughs) but the few people who I have brought that up to they're just like yeah it's Mm -hmm. so weird yeah. Why does no one talk about that? Because it's just it's just a second where you're just like, huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it just seems funny that, I don't know, like, I feel like people would relate to that more. And I feel like if people were more aware that that's happening, it would make them feel way more comfortable mm-hmm. with, you know, knowing that they can alter the way that they're feeling, that no one else can mm-hmm. affect the way that you're feeling except yourself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know provide some relief (laughs) it's all it's also so tricky because like we had this conversation like when we first moved in together just Mm -hmm. the simple um belief that everything happens for a reason yeah so even the deep deep dark depression and the uncontrollable anxiety and all the horrible external life situation things that happen like who are we to say that that's wrong and to try Mm -hmm. to stop that even though like bad mental health feels so horrible and so constricting and so trapping even that like I believe okay like this is still for something not that I want to stay there forever but just that there are lessons to learn here even if I'm not able to realize that until I reflect on it months or years later absolutely which is like it's so hard again to like tell another person or to tell yourself this is for a reason yeah because we as humans like we have an aversion to pain and we're attracted to pleasure Mm. but it's but then also sometimes um addicted to misery and Mm. self-loathing we're so addicted to it and like especially for people who are dealing with mental illnesses like I mean, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I know for me and a few other people I know who really struggle with mental health, um, sometimes, um, I don't really feel like I struggle with with it that much anymore, um, which I can also kind of get into later, but, um, you know, people are addicted to, like, having problems and, you know, making up um, their own kind of misery. Like, they like being unhappy and having to, like, worry about something. Um, it's just so interesting and I see yeah. that like I do that as well mm-hmm. like just wanting like it almost feels more comfortable to have a problem yeah or something like that because I I wonder why that is I can kind of think of words to describe it but it's not completely accurate it's almost like it takes the pressure or the mm-hmm. responsibility off of ourselves to like be ourselves in a sense and yeah. not only it's not like oh it takes the pressure off of me or the responsibility off of me to go do something in the world um because whatever you do in the world is what you do there's no right or wrong you don't need to create some grand thing yeah but yeah it does seem like a little bit and again this word might sound like belittling but it seems like kind of a cop-out that you do to yourself where you're like okay well you know I can't go this is just a little example. Like I can't go study for my test because like I am way too depressed to like do anything right now. Yeah. And yeah, that might be the case in the moment, but if you keep feeding into that story, again, it's not as simple as the words I'm saying, but if you keep feeding into your story and you keep being addicted to our negative emotions, then you're just going to stay there as with any addiction. Yeah. You're just identifying with, with the condition um and definitely I think part of it for some people is kind of like alleviating that pressure of um themselves having to fix something in Mm -hmm. a sense even if it's not like necessarily like directly thought of that way I think that kind of 
can play into it where, um, you know, when you're self pitying, Mm -hmm. like, Oh, woe is me. Um, and like this also is just kind of in general, not even for like depression, but people love just like, um, pitying themselves because like they want to feel like it's happening to them. It's not not their fault. Yeah. Not that they're doing it. Um, Because then, you know, you save yourself time and effort of working on yourself and having to figure out, you know, what you can do to help make your life better. I think it's just kind of part also of, um, in a sense, the ego just trying to really make you latch on to a narrative, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting blame or anything on people. I think that's just a a horrible thing humans have to deal with. It's part of our journey to growth. Yeah. And so it's not like, oh, you're wrong for doing this. Look at you, like fucking up by getting caught in this trap like the whole like part of the path of growth is recognizing our traps and getting free of them one by one and yeah it's not right or wrong it's just all part of the journey and it's honestly a blessing that we're caught in these traps because (laughs) we can help other people get out of theirs yep that's Um, exactly and that's like a big thing for all of the negative experiences I've had they're not fun I learn about myself through them and it helps me recognize my own like being or -hmm. whatever but then it also like one of the really big things that I um have been learning like over the past like year I suppose it's been a big theme is all of like this like darkness that I go through all these shadows that I go through like it's teaching me so much empathy and I feel like I'm able to connect so much more to other people now because of those hard times and you know like the good times bring us together and the hard times bring us together too and I feel like we connect so much better by you know seeing all sides of ourselves and this is something that I talked I think I was talking to you guys about this the other day Mm -hmm. but when I really get to know someone like I don't want to just know the good things about them I want to know everything I want to see all of their flaws all the ways that they think they're lacking because it just shows me that they're more real and I don't see them any differently because like when I look at you I'm not seeing like all of the things that you've labeled yourself as being flawed like I'm almost seeing like your essence Mm -hmm. and like that thing is always beautiful and like always radiant no matter what yeah and even like seeing Mm -hmm. like flaws like that's that's you yeah and I know that that's something that's said all the time but you know if everyone was perfect I feel like we would just be so in ourselves like I mean again this is like weird speculations but (laughs) and I I feel like in relationships like the more super superficial relationships are the ones where everything's always good yeah everything's like, always that's good not real. no <laughs> it's not real and you you're not going to get true connection with people by pretending that everything's always good yeah and yeah you can have fun and celebrate with other people but you're really going to connect by letting yourself be vulnerable and saying like hey like I'm letting my guard down like this is where I feel where I'm lacking and like I want you to see this because I trust you yeah and that's so fucking beautiful like I feel when someone is vulnerable with me in that way like they like their beauty just amplifies like tenfold because it's just real it's real you're not Mm -hmm. pretending we don't want perfect we want real yeah exactly I mean and because I mean in a sense like perfection doesn't exist but at the same time everything is perfect it's because perfect it's exactly it's, yeah. the way it is. <laughs> it wasn't sp- it wasn't going to be any other way. Um, but I know it's just I remember uh, my one of my ex boyfriends. Uh, we had like a really great relationship at first, and then thing you know, of course, as every relationship happens, some stuff come you know will happen. And I just remember him t- telling me how he really thought that the way that relationships were depicted in movies and, you know, in the media, that that's, like, actually what happens. And I've never heard someone be honest that they really thought that, like, a perfect relationship was chased after like that. And I was just like, whoa. I was just like, that's just, I don't know, it was just crazy. Or I'm like, no, like, that's just not how it works. And it's so crazy how that type of media really gets into your head like that to mm-hmm. put in those uh those ideal expectations um but like that just sounds 
sounds awful, honestly. Like a hunky dory, happy, happy relationship. Happily ever like after. That. Yeah. Because yeah. like, there's no growth in that. Yeah. You can't exactly. grow together. Exactly. It's like the way that it's depicted in movies and the media a lot of the time. Like even like um, in like the world of like celebrities and the yeah. rich and famous and all of that. It's often depicted as these two perfect people come together and then the perfectness just becomes even bigger. And (laughs) that's kind of how it is depicted, like, in movies and stuff like that. But then you see, like, in tabloids and stuff like that, that it usually doesn't last very long. Yeah. Some shit goes down. There's cheating. There's divorce. There's lawsuits. I'm going to sue you for everything you own because... (laughs) I don't know. And you can you can see that it those things if it's not real it's not going to work out. Right. And we also see that in how so many people rush into marriage um and it just does not seem to always work because of the <laughs> communication and the honesty isn't there. And that's something yeah. we've been talking about a lot this week is in relationships and this is often said so much so it sounds cliché but honesty is so incredibly important in with yourself with your relationship with anything to yourself to another person to life if you can't be authentic and honest you're cheating yourself out of your experience and you're cheating yourself out of fully giving and receiving love and honesty isn't just about what you say it's about all the things that you don't say all the things that you're hiding and when you're completely honest and vulnerable and open with yourself another person or life that means you're saying here is all of me here's all the angry things I want to say here's all the loving things I want to say here's all the perfect parts of myself here's all the ugly parts of myself and by being open and vulnerable with any facet of life Mm -hmm. it's able to reflect back to you more of you and that's like why in any relationship it's like you're using that other person as a mirror and you guys are mirrors for each other so that you can learn more about yourself absolutely yeah and I mean just being able to learn to accept and embrace it like everything like that's just that's so huge you know, you just, you have to, like, it's just... It's scary, though. It's scary. Being vulnerable is so scary. It is, um, but it just feels so good. Yeah, it once really you does. get past that yeah. resistance, once yeah. you break through that barrier, it's just, like, a huge breath, a huge release. Like, you literally feel your body just soften. You're like, oh, yeah. Now someone know someone knows it. Yeah. And that doesn't mean, like, go around screaming, I think that I'm, I don't know. Like, don't go around, like, screaming your insecurities into the streets, but it's just when you're with someone, whatever the situation is, you're just completely authentic and honest in that moment. And that moment's all you need to worry about. You don't need to go searching for ways to make yourself vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's just whatever the moment presents, you're just honest and authentic in that moment to the best of your ability. And that's, like, a big pitfall. I think people... Once they ch- are trying to learn how to be more open, they go and search for ways in which they're not open. Mm-hmm. And you're just running away from the moment. And right. What it's you're, just right there. Yeah, it's just right there. Just whatever you're doing, be fully there for that moment and be as honest as you can in that moment. And you'll be fine. You don't need to go looking anywhere else. Do you think there's such thing as trusting too much with people? I think that you can definitely be... A little naive mm-hmm. in that sense maybe that's not the correct word but it works <laughs> um, whereas you need to be a little bit skeptical because yeah you can be vulnerable but you can almost like feel in your body when you're sharing a little bit too much <laughs> yeah, no, you, you absolutely can that's so true actually like it will start feeling that's a little so bit forced yeah um, and I think that when you're being vulnerable with other people it really there's varying degrees of vulnerability that you need to be. So you can be honest and authentic in a relationship with your boss. That doesn't mean you're going to be telling him about your like sexual fantasies, you know, like (laughs) you, unless you share them. (laughs) Yeah. You know, um, I guess it depends on your relationship to your boss, but, uh, yeah, I really think it just is 
dependent on the situation and we have those like systems in our bodies to know like oh in this relationship like we don't talk about this not because I'm not being honest with that person but that's just not the dynamic of the relationship um you know like you're going to interact with uh like a police officer differently than you're going to interact with your homie so you know it's just like being appropriate in the situations and I think that if when you're really, really going into like the deep, deep, dark parts of yourself and you feel called to share that, like you sh- should be able to feel in the relationship that like this is safe. Mm-hmm. And there's a mutual understanding between people that like this is a safe space and you should be able to feel that. So, you know, it might be a little scary to share that, but I know like with someone like you, like I know it's a safe space to share anything. Whereas mm-hmm. I could share something with another friend Um, but I just might not go as in depth, not because I'm not being super honest, but just in that moment, that's not what's appropriate. Right. Yeah. And it just doesn't feel as, as right. Cause there is kind of a weird, um, lingering feeling I feel when you do kind of overshare. Yeah. Overshare with someone and it's kind of, it's just like that weird discomfort. Yeah. And it almost like, uh, I mean, you know, I think this probably just has to do with, like, attachment and identity. But it almost feels like it's, like, you kind of, um, like, I don't know, what's the right phrasing of it? I guess in a sense, um, I guess because it's just because you're putting yourself out there and in a sense of rejection mm. or, like, dislike. But um, it almost just feels like you kind of, like, lose a part of you in a sense. Because mm. it takes so much to be vulnerable. It does. For some people, I guess. I guess it does seem like. Some people don't really have an issue on it or like maybe they're anxious and they just can't stop talking. Yeah. And no, it's so tricky. And with anything, it's all completely dependent on the situation. And you're going to feel in that moment what is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, yeah, in this in this situation, I and you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to think like, oh, is this okay for me to share right now? Mm -hmm. You just kind of know it's an intuitive thing. Yeah. Where you're just like, okay, yeah, I can be open. I can be like more deeply open or vulnerable in this situation. Yeah. But also in relationships, being in this space of being vulnerable and open is kind of like you don't have any walls up. So it's not even necessarily what you're saying or what you're sharing, but it's just almost like letting your heart and mind be open to give and receive freely. So you're not like searching for things to reject or accept. You're just rejecting. You're just, you're just accepting everything that's coming in from the other person. So you're yeah. like fully seeing them, fully listening to them. And you're letting yourself be fully seen and fully heard. Cause I, I, love that. <laughs> I noticed this with myself too, is like sometimes we, when we're speaking, we're almost not letting ourself be heard or seen Mm -hmm. like we're speaking but there's almost this resistance inside of ourselves that like thinks that it's just kind of bouncing off the other person so we almost rush through what we're saying we're not speaking with as much openness as we could like Mm -hmm. things still feel a little bit tight or restrained so I think that's like another thing to work through when you speak yeah is that or is that with like everybody still or is that more so with people you might like you may not have that um like a strong of a click with I don't know I, can't, I really think it's just dependent on the situation yeah. and the person but I I have noticed that with myself and with other people is yeah we tend to rush through uh conversations and we're not speaking with as much like dignity or clarity mm-hmm. because we think that the other person isn't really listening to us or that they don't really care. And I think that that ties back into a situation of like how we're listening to other people. So if we're fully seeing and hearing the other person and we're practicing that, I think we begin to learn that the other person has the capacity for that same thing. And so we begin to speak with a little bit more dignity. Yeah, Mm -hmm. completely, completely agree with that. Communic- yeah. language is so beautiful <laughs> i know we were just talking about that yeah. and it's so cool i mean even it's just cool that it's like it's man-made it's a man-made tool that allows us to connect as much as we can to connect about like what this is yeah what the human thing is and of course because it's man-made it could never fully encapture it but it's so cool that i almost like that you can't fully <laughs> capture it you know I think that's um, kind of, I don't know, having that ambiguity, 
Oh, ambiguity. ambiguity. <laughs> Um, but it, it, I don't know, it just makes life almost more exciting and, mm-hmm. and thrilling. Because there's all those unknowns in there. Mm-hmm. And it's almost poetic, the fact that we can never fully describe something with words, that it's something that can only be felt. Mm-hmm. And so that's why with music or uh, some writing or art and things like that, like it's, again, just pointing to this feeling or this... I guess it's just like a feeling, this experience, yeah. and we can try to talk about it all we want, and that's awesome and beautiful, but when we're speaking and we connect through our words, it's because we both land on the same like concept or principle that we're talking about, and so it's not necessarily that we're learning from the words, but we both reach this place where like, oh yes, like you, we're both pointing to the same thing here, mm-hmm. we're both feeling the same thing here, and so the way that we connect is not through our speech but that we both land in that same point of ah oh, like here we are if like we're both talking about like a certain experience at, it's interesting like at the same time that we're speaking we have like all this visual imagery and things happening in our mind to like recreate a certain experience or to create a certain experience yeah and the words are just all things pointing to that it's <laughs> so crazy how our how the people work (laughs) oh my gosh I just everything is so precise and it allows us to be so just amazing oh my gosh humans are just amazing so much detail in everything yeah what like how like down to the very tiny atoms and just like the exact science behind like how a cell needs to function and like how all they all have different duties that need to be done and it just does it like mm-hmm. it's like not necessarily conscience like it's just intelligent yeah yeah but like how i mean you know yeah it's, it's just, just so beautiful it all fits and it's all like it all also kind of reflects out onto the the outer world too like um you know have you seen like those images where they'll compare like um, I don't know, for example, like, you know, the iris of your eye to mm. galaxies. That yeah. It's like, it actually, like, so weirdly mirrors each other. The micro and the macro yeah. thing. Yeah, that is so interesting. And we, like, we have talked about this, like, even the exact placement of planet Earth. Right. And how even from that, like, very, very precise placement of the earth and then the fact that that was able to generate life on it it was able to inhabit life but then the fact that life actually sprung from that is just so incredibly precise and at least for me like I cannot just like leave that up to chance like there is this intelligence that is throughout everything like this consciousness that is like the very fabric of everything and whatever that is it was pretty cool. Keep doing your thing. <laughs> and I, and since that is all so perfect, how the ways that nature does its thing and it's so perfect, but we come into our own lives and we find all these problems, things shouldn't be this way. Mm-hmm. And we think that there's so many errors that life is messing up or that we're messing up. And, you know, we do have some autonomy, it seems maybe, to make decisions that change the course of our path um so that we can really in the end connect better to ourselves and to other people and to life but even that is all perfect just the way that yeah. you know a little a little sprout coming out of the ground isn't like i'm i'm so lacking and blah 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 <laughs> it just knows that that's part of the process to grow into this like mighty oak tree yeah it and, just does it yeah and, you know, maybe ants are eating at the leaves and it, like, starts to dry up because it doesn't get enough sun and then whatever. But, like, that's just all part of the growth and that's all part mm-hmm. of what it needs to go through to reach, I don't know, whatever it needs to reach. Yeah. Yeah, and tying that kind of all back together, like, it's weird to say, but I'm, like, so extremely grateful for, like, every, like, horrible thing I've gone through. Me too. Um, not to, you know everyone goes through their own horrible things but yeah like all like I'm so thankful for it because it just makes me appreciate life more like knowing that it's so precious and that it's like what you need to make it 
and that just being here is such a gift like what and like being able to be awake and love people and just love yourself and grow and like you know make meaning out of something like this yeah like, that's so beautiful it I really that. is like getting down to like that very simple point that guys who knows what this is but we have something and we can label that as a beautiful gift or we can label that as a curse yeah and if you choose to label it as a gift like how precious is this little life that we have it's so beautiful. we can't see the bigger picture we're only seeing this tiny blip in the grand timeline of things in which we get to play a little part yeah and we get so caught up in all of the problems and all of the drama of the human condition but to really just let that all fade away for a second and be like I'm experiencing something and I'm experiencing all the horrors and I'm experiencing all of the beauty and wow just wow it leaves you speechless and how can you describe or how can you label life as good or bad or as I don't know, something that you wouldn't want. Right. If it's all you have and all you've ever known. Right. And, you know, on like a personal level, we can obviously label experiences as good or bad because, you know, pain and pleasure. We can see where there's love or there's hate, there's fear, there's anger. And we have the ability to, you know, address those things. But just to become quiet and still for a moment and just be like, wow. Mm Mm-hmm wow like a precious human life wow it's so humbling it's so humbling (laughs) it really is and it's just all gratitude yeah and just when you're able to kind of swap your mindset from being the self-pity like I don't know wanting just always wanting something else not being happy um to then, I mean, and I'm just talking about my, what my shift yeah. of mindset this has is been. all about you. Yeah. It's all about your experience. <laughs> no, I'm saying uh, this is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, everyone's, you know, own struggles are their own. Um, but yeah, mine, going from like that to now just being so grateful and just loving life and like even no matter what good situation or bad situation may come like yes even though the bad ones are obviously still a struggle it's like I'm almost just happy to feel yeah (laughs) to experience that and know that you know something will change from this that will be a good change something that I need and that is just so so nice and just being okay with change and just like learning how to be comfortable with the uncomfortable is so huge and it just makes life so much more fun and interesting and I just more enjoyable honestly Mm -hmm. and even like through again those bad times like it's still enjoyable in a sense because it's like this is my experience Mm -hmm. and what the hell is going on Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's so cool yeah and it can feel awful yeah but again it's like that little place inside you that's just like we're still experiencing I still got you we're Mm -hmm. still we're still doing this together and faith is so so important so Audrey Eliza and I we drove out to Joshua Tree uh the day before yesterday yeah and um it was just so like nice to see all the little pieces come together so that our trip could happen from Teddy letting us borrow his car to Scott lending us his tent and um uh, like other things falling together and so we get there and there's just like a swarm of like bees everywhere like these hornets everywhere and we're like oh no but we had gotten there a lot later in the day than we anticipated but then even that was a blessing because as soon as it got dark the bees went away right. and we saw the most beautiful sunset like I well at least one of the most beautiful mm-hmm. sunsets I've ever seen in Joshua Tree And then we just laid on this picnic table and we just talked and stared at the stars for hours. And those were some of the best stars I've ever seen in my life. Like so beautiful. You could just 
stare up and just go deeper and deeper and deeper and just see more and more and more and you could see the Milky Way and then the moon started to rise over the rocks and it like as Audrey said it chased the stars away and yeah it was just so beautiful but that was something that we were talking about when we were laying on that picnic benches faith is really everything because we do not know what's going to happen we don't know why we're here we cannot even possibly begin to understand these intricate workings of life but we can find comfort and we can find that um contentness by knowing you know everything is going to be okay maybe everything isn't going to be exactly what i want yeah but it's always going to be okay and if you can trust that things are working for you then you can embrace life more and you can stop resisting and it's not necessarily I've like I've noticed by like surrendering to life it's not necessarily that things are maybe like changing for the better it seems like they're changing for the better but it's maybe I'm just finally like accepting what's happening and maybe that just feels better yeah so you know I don't know which one is happening maybe they're both (laughs) kind of happening at the same time but whether it's from acceptance or whether it's because things outside me are actually changing, like life is just better once you start to cultivate faith and so much better. (laughs) It's just more comfortable in a sense of like being comfortable with the uncomfortable when you are able to completely give in and be like, okay, like I just have faith in whatever happens. Like, as you said, it's just going to be okay. And like, even though in a sense there isn't really a good and bad um it still feels like it's ambivalent you know Mm. it just feels good and like it just feels right you know even though because I just feel like if I think to the core of humans no matter what it's like it's all love Mm -hmm. you know and it wouldn't if it were evil if like consciousness were in a sense evil like that's not how it would be it would not be like love which is you know definitely the foundation of everything everything's out of love yeah and that even like all the evilness that happens in the world i mean we can call it evil we can say that there's good and evil but we can also say that all the evilness is just like these like cries for love because Mm -hmm. they're just doing the best that they can and it's just they're doing it very ineffectively yeah (laughs) (laughs) Um, and you know maybe it's like our job as people who have become more connected to love and realize this love a little bit more to reflect that to people who are hurting or people who are quote-unquote committing evil acts because you know you're not going to be able to fight hurt with more hurt um even if maybe your actions look like they're like violent or something if that's fueled by love it's never going to be wrong and it's exactly what needs to happen and yeah that's I lost my train of thought again <laughs> um I feel like we should start to wrap it up because I think we need to okay. get your ass to the airport soon. Oh, shoot. But do you want to yeah. quickly share your ghost story and then we'll wrap it up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll try to, to do a, a quick, interesting summary. Um, so basically, um, my so this is on my dad's side of the family. Mm-hmm. My grandmother and grandfather both grew up in Baltimore as well. And... Um, In high school, my grandmother was always known as kind of being a very, like, popular, cute, loving woman, Um, you know, had a bunch of friends, having a nice life, and then by the time she was kind of, like, in her early 20s, um, she started playing around with a lot of demonic stuff, and was, like, playing with Ouija boards, and, like, reading into weird stuff, and people say that, like, after that, she just, like, completely did a 180 on her personality, and was just awful and my uh my grandfather and her were like high school sweethearts so they got married and he was a doctor um but we're like pretty sure he like she was never diagnosed with anything but we're pretty sure she had um bipolar disorder borderline personality disorder definitely had narcissism um and compulsive lying like just like a bunch of you know big old stew of stuff (laughs) um she basically, um, I guess, skip for, skipping forward to when my dad and uncle were born, she was, like, really abusive towards them. And, uh, like, mentally, physically, emotionally, all, like, awful to my dad mm-hmm. and my uncle. And um, 
they uh, they moved into this house, which ended up being the house that I later moved into with my family, um, and uh, basically just had a heart attack and died in the house. And uh, my mom kind of has the theory that like when she was messing around with demonic stuff, that she like kind of allowed a portal to open, then allowed like a negative spirit to like latch onto her, and. Uh, she hated my mom, my grand- like my dad's mom hated my mom. Uh, my mom was really religious. My dad never grew up in a Christian household, but um, she- he became a Christian through like learning through uh, my mom's side of the family. Mm-hmm. And she like my grandmother like would try to ruin the wedding, like did all this crazy stuff, like was just awful to my mom and my mom's mom. And um, when she died. Um, you know, my grandfather remarried, and my parents were like, okay, well, let's, you know, move into a bigger house, um, since the girls are growing up, and, um, just all of this crazy stuff happened within the first two months of us living there. We moved in in August, um, when I was eight or nine, actually, I was nine, um, my older sister was 11, and the first thing was that, like, my dog was, like, just a normal, you know, black lab, very, like, dopey and happy all the time. But, like, when we tried to get him to go in the house, he would just, like, scrape his nails uh-huh. on the cement going to the house, like, screaming. He was like, no, 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 like, I'm not going to go. Um, and he would just sprint straight down to the basement. And, like, we're like, we don't have an invisible fence lined up. Like, we don't know what to do. Um, and he would just dart in and out of the house to directly to the basement, which is right next to the front door. Um, and, uh, my sister every single night would like wake up screaming in the middle of the night and would like grab all her stuffed animals off the bed and run to my parents' room, sleep on the floor. Cause she heard footsteps walking back and forth in between, uh, a few different places, but basically always next to her room. And my parents were like, it's just an old house. Don't worry. You know, it's just going to creak. It's fine. But they felt so bad. They didn't know what to do. Um, and, you know, a lot of stereotypical movie stuff happened. Like, you would put something down, you'd look away. Next thing you know, it's on the way other side of the room. Um, the channel would, like, change randomly. Um, my mom would, like, leave the kitchen and come back and all the cabinet doors were all open. Um, we were all eating pizza or something together as a family. And we heard this huge bang in the library, which was, like, the only room that hadn't really been redone that much. Um, everything was the same and uh, we go into the library and every single book on the bookshelf was like on the ground it was just completely cleared it was so weird Um, and another time we were all together we heard a loud bang and we go upstairs and my grandmother had of course given my sister a doll (laughs) it's so freaky looking actually it's pretty it's pretty but it's still the concept of like having a haunted doll is so scary Um, but um, it was in like this glass case, but when we went upstairs, the doll had been thrown across the room and the glass all was like in the same place, but it had been completely shattered. So it was just like, okay, that doesn't make sense. And of course, while like all this is happening, we're not really like putting together dots. We're just kind of like, oh, that's weird. Oh, that's weird. Huh? Um, it was August. We didn't have like the AC set up yet and there were drafts, so that didn't make sense. Um, there was a painting hanging in one of the rooms and my mom like left to go do something. No one else was in the house. She came back in and uh, the painting had been like thrown on the floor and there was like this light, like a little museum light on the frame that would shine on the painting and it was screwed into the frame, but um, it had been like forcefully like ripped off of the painting. Like it not like a screw fell out or anything. Yeah. It was like ripped off. Um, and, um, what's another one? Oh, yeah. And then, um, one time my mom was vacuum cleaning in the guest room and, um, she had to go pick up me and my sister from school because it was probably like September by now. Mm -hmm. And, um, she like left the vacuum cleaner, unplugged it, put it back out in the hallway, went to go pick up me and my sister. When we came home, she went upstairs and the vacuum cleaner was pulled back into the guest room and there were like all these boxes on top of the guest room bed um, with dust all over it that had been left for my grandparents. Um, and my the cord of the vacuum cleaner had been pulled up under the comforter of the bed and like plugged into the wall on the other side and was running. And like no fingerprints or anything on the boxes. Like there's no way that someone could have done that without moving the boxes. 
Whoa. And my mom was like, all right, that one's weird. That's a weird one. <laughs> and then um, there was like one night where, um, I think this was the last one. Um, it was one night where my mom and I were sleeping in the pull-out couch by my sister's room for some reason. And um, there had been like people spending the night at the house. And my mom and I were trying to sleep and there were like heels clicking through the kitchen and like went up the stairs. Um, it's kind of like an open stairway up to the room. Mm-hmm. And um, like we felt like a presence there just staring at us. And it was so fucking scary. <laughs> It was so scary and but like at the same time it like I was nine so I was like still very like I didn't believe in ghosts or anything like that um and but like I knew like something felt weird and there's like definitely a weird sense that I can still kind of get every now and then whenever I'm like in a potentially I guess spiritually high place um but my mom was like oh my god like that is the noise of like what Kate my older sister has been hearing every single night of those heels like clicking um and so after that that was the final straw for my mom where uh her and my dad got like an exorcism on the house where people in the church came um and like blessed every single corner of the door every single corner of the window said a prayer in every room and then my parents said like when they said the final the final amen they felt it leave the house which was so spooky so weird I still though like I don't think this is really related, but I've definitely have gotten um, a lot of sleep paralysis, uh, or not a lot, but a few episodes like in the house, still. But I think for the mo- besides that, like it totally has like a different feeling of, to, you know. Wow. I don't. Know, it's, just... it's that stuff like interests me so much because I don't have any like paranormal experiences. Mm. Yeah. But I totally believe it. Right. Like I believe you. You know. Thanks. And like other worrying. people, because. <laughs> You know, you can, like, hear about this, like, on TV and, like, whatever, like, read books about it. But when you, like, (laughs) when, like, one of your, like, close friends tells you about this, I'm like, yeah, I obviously believe them. Yeah. Like, it's just so crazy. There's, like, all these other, like, layers to reality or all these other, like, realms even just within our reality that are just happening and we're just not aware of it usually. (laughs) So, like, that stuff just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. It really does. But also, like, that stuff terrifies me so much because I just, I don't know what it is and I really do believe that it opens up portals to stuff that, like, maybe we're not supposed to be disturbing. Yeah. And it's scary. No, it's, that's terrifying. (laughs) I wanted, I wanted to hear that story, though. (sighs) Well, thanks for letting me tell it. No, thank you. And thank you for going, like, so far into your own journey because you know like I've obviously like known you for a fair amount of time and I would like you're like one of my really like closest friends Aww, um but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um but you know it's like not very often that you know even as friends like you sit across the table from each other and just like speak for what has it been an hour and a half yeah so oh my gosh yeah <laughs> that's crazy yeah it really flies um no, but it, it's just been, like, really awesome to, like, hear into, like, the little details of your story and all of that. So thank you so much for coming on and letting yeah. yourself be vulnerable and open in thank this you. space so I can send it out to the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, so everyone can know. <laughs> yeah, all two of my subscribers. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much for having me. It's so thank you. lovely to be with you. It's been such a lovely week of, you know, being vulnerable and feeling myself open up, you know, after some, some challenges throughout the past few weeks, but it's just been very lovely. And it's, you know, I agree, you know, storytelling and hearing people's life is different lives that they walk are my favorite thing about life. Me too. For many people. (laughs) Oh, I love you. I love you too. (laughs) I don't want to drop you off at the airport. I know. Uh, Okay. Well, let's, wrap up this episode so that we're not feeling rushed when when we leave oh (laughs) um okay guys well thank you so much this has been episode five of this human thing here with the lovely eliza o donovan and (laughs) yeah i hope the audio sounded okay like i said i have all of the podcast stuff set up on the table right now but none of it's working i'm recording on my voice memos on my phone because my computer decided to not turn on anyway um, you can follow This Human Thing on Instagram, at This Human Thing. There's also a Facebook page. 
Um, and if you want to check out the website, you can go to www.kellis.co slash podcast. You can listen to This Human Thing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts. We have video recordings on YouTube. You can get a little more behind the scenes over there. It kind of looks like I have a mullet right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, if you want to support the show, you can leave a review and a rating on apple Podcasts. that would be banging so thank you in advance for leaving your uh your review and subscribing uh if you want to additionally support you can subscribe to my patreon which i will also have in the show notes and you can follow eliza on instagram <laughs> if you want i don't know what your name is it's just eliza o'donovan i think Oh, perfect. <laughs> Follow her. Do you have anything else you want to plug? Um, uh, just um, love yourself, you know. If not now, start now, you know. Just work on this. I don't have any other social media, but definitely, you know, pop on a good song. Do a little dance. You'll feel better. Plug self-love. Yep, plug self-love. <laughs> don't force it on yourself. It's not another thing on your to-do list to check off. It's just... um an intention to keep around you exactly Mm -hmm. it's a very good reminder actually (sighs) again i don't have all my little notes so i might be missing out on some things but that is fine and anyway guys thanks for listening to yet another episode we have episodes coming out every monday and whatever you're doing just keep doing it with love keep doing your thing peace in Peace out. Woohoo! Bam. Yeah, nice. Good thing you so much. I love you too. I don't want to leave. Well, you don't have to. You don't want to. Okay. Um. Okay. <laughs> So that is saved. Wait, we gotta take a post, a post show shelfie. Mm-hmm. Not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna read bun. Oh, hey video. What's up, guys? Um, or we could even just like take one on here. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see. Oh, we gotta put the sign on. Oh no, I never put the sign on. That's okay. I'll, I'll do it with Audrey's. Audrey's. Oh, I just totally forgot, guys. What's the best way to do it? <laughs> my bros. I was born to the six with my bros. Okay, beautiful. Goodbye. I'm keeping that in.